Hey, everybody. Welcome to Tone Talk with Mark Uzanski and Dave Friedman. We have a fantastic guest tonight, Joe Bonamassa. What's up, Joe? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Nice to see you again, Dave. Nice to meet you, Mark. Same here. You know, it's really, really fun. Yeah, you're the you're the quintessential tone talker, I think. I you know, I have a, I have a few opinions that may or may <laughs> be polarizing to some or triggering to the youth um, about how things are done. But you know, it's all just an opinion. No, I mean you've been living it. It's not just an opinion. It's in your DNA at this point. Well, you know, we can we can we can get into it, but yeah, I. Yeah. Think the, the it, I think the the greatest threat to guitar mankind is the notion that stage volumes need to be lower than the volume in which we speak we are speaking at. I think that does wonders for 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 kind of uh, siphoning the mid range and the tone out of guitar players' rigs. You know, because it's like there's the air is not moving and and the you know it, it may sound fine in the ears. But but in reality, what's coming out of the house is not certainly to quote a friend, not better for being lower in volume. It's at best the same, if not a little bit worse. Yeah, we've talked about this. Absolutely. Amen. Yeah, we agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> the other the other thing it doesn't uh, the other thing the other problem is it's uh, all the excitement is gone. It's you know, as exciting as a root canal. There's no, uh, there's no feedback. There's no nothing. You know, there's no anything that that you deem as a great guitar sound and everything is, it's just gone. It's well, you know, I mean, I'm looking at in in both of these shots, I'm looking at uh, what appears to be three, maybe four, four by twelve cabinets. Yeah, and yeah. that used to be SOP, even in the clubs, standard mm -hmm. operating procedure. Yeah. Here's a four by twelve. Give me a Marshall. Give me a Freeman. Give me whatever. Here's a four by twelve. We're good. You know, you know, cut it with a twin. You play an eight hundred seater. Now a Princeton reverb in an arena is somehow so uh, 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 toxic to the la out out front sound that that people in large situations are being told there is no amps on stage. You got to go to a completely digital platform. And again, you know, it, you know, I, I always use the example like B.B. King, Albert King, um, Jimi Hendrix, uh, Jeff Beck. They all had big sounds because they had big amps, you know, and and, you know, Hendrix had multiple big amps, Clapton, multiple big amps. And it always, and if, and if they were using a small combo, they'd probably have it going through the monitors to, to get the headroom. There's a certain symbiotic thing that happens between the guitar and the amplifier that if you take that away, it, the, the actual conduit in which you're delivering the tone is severed. You know, um, I see people now they're Bluetoothing to amps. They're the, you know, the wireless thing has been around forever, but to, to plug into a loud tube amp and sit close to it and see how the guitar reacts and how it feels under the strings mm -hmm. is something you cannot replicate digitally. And it's the only th way you can replicate that is by turning it up. And that's the nature of what we do. It, we are loud and obnoxious. Embrace it, you know? Yeah, Amen. if you're going to listen to guitar music, embrace it. Absolutely. I'm going to be canceled like in five minutes after this. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. It's nothing uh, I haven't said. No, absolutely. Hey, before well, we go ahead, Joe. Go but, I mean, so my question to you, Dave, is, is 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 your 100 watt platforms, are they the best sellers or is the 20 watt better selling than 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 the hundreds or 50s? You know, that's interesting. Um, well, I mean, we have for a lot of years sold much more 100 watt amps than most everyone else in the business. We've sold a lot of them. Yeah. And is that the best selling amp? No, probably one of the 20 watts might be one of the better sounding amps because you can just, well, put more out. And, you know, there's a lot of people that are just playing at their house and stuff. And then, you know, yeah. we, we make those little ones sound like big ones, but, you know, as much as possible. 
hundred percent. But yeah. um, yeah, no, but we've sold a lot of hundred watt amps, and we still sell hundred watt amps and fifty watt amps, and you know, I think uh, I have the first or second dirty Shirley. Yeah, under in a hundred watt. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, but anyway, I, I know you guys got to get to your uh, your your. No, 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 that's good. What what tubes are in that that hundred watt? Dirty Shirley, Dave. It's six L six or fifty eight eighty one. So it was just, oh, okay. it was like uh it was like a forty it was sort of like a Marshall forty five hundred power section mm. uh the, with the dirty Shirley front end on it and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, before we dive in, we want to uh just let you guys know about Sweetwater Guitar Month this month. Um make sure you check it out. So uh if you check out Guitar Month, obviously. Sweetwater is one of the best places to buy your guitars. Uh, the number one place is to really buy buy your guitar. And uh, they have the 55-point inspection, uh, the guitar gallery. So make sure you check out Sweetwater this month. It's this month, September, for Guitar Month. So I'm really kind of scrolling through here. You can see that they've got guitars that are plucked on sale. Um, and you can see all the guitars. And each guitar that you buy there is you can see the picture of the actual guitar with the serial number so uh make sure you check out sweetwater this month and and you can also purchase using our link below okay and also check out fixpedalboards.com as well as tomon please check out our new sponsor tomon and with that said back, back to, to joe, joe. <laughs> i will say this about sweetwater and they've built such a beautiful business from a mm -hmm. business point of view, how, how it's customer service down. It's the cost. Yeah. Yeah, everybody has their own, um, like kind of, uh, what do they call them? Ambassadors or, 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 you know, like they, you have, you have a person over there that's in charge of your account. <clears throat> With that said, I've been playing Fort Wayne, Indiana for 30 years. Mm. And even going back to when some uh, religious person, saw that I was a teenager playing there with uh, my old band Bloodline and got the show canceled because I didn't have the child performing permit. Oh, I've man. been going to Fort Wayne, Indiana for a long time. A long time is what I'm saying. Like, and we're, I think we're going there this fall. The amount of improvement that I've seen in that community, the infrastructure, the buildings, there's way more restaurants. Like, it's like the town came back to life. And you go, well, that's the power of Sweetwater. And, and a little central Indiana town is booming because of that business. And, and my hat's off to, to everyone involved because they're good people in that part of the world that are very supportive of music. And, and an industry like that moving in and, and, and flourishing really has put the town in a much, much better position than it was like even 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's it, it's a it's a it's a very cool thing to see. I, every time I go back, I'm like, wow, this is really cool to see Fort Wayne, Indiana. It's like it's like rocket, you know, and it's like. Have you played that little that that not little that but that's amphitheater that they have there behind the. No, we play the embassy theater. there. OK, um, that's been our jam since 2005. I like the I like theaters. Yeah. Um, I like the I like the free reverb. I think my act plays better in a 2500 seater. Mm. Um, I'm used to it. Um, I, I like, I like the feel of wood, uh, you know, un, under my feet mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, you know, it, this country is just has so many beautiful, you know, art deco theaters that are between 2000 and 4,000, maybe some larger, um, theaters yeah. that we've been lucky enough to play for the last, you know, 13 or 14 years, um, that I look forward to going back time and time again. You know, I mean, I've, I've played amphitheaters, I've played arenas, played it, played it all. But my happy zone is on stage in front of 2,500 people. And it feels intimate, but it's big enough to where you can afford to bring a, a real production, your own PA lights, monitors, blah, blah, blah. And so it, to me, is the, the it's, that's the, for my kind of music, it's, 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 that's, that's the right fit. Plus, it's also the the rooms that I I, I used to open up for BB King, and so good enough for BB mm -hmm. King, good enough for me. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, there's some great. I'm from Detroit originally, and you know, oh, there's Fox some great is the best. Fox, the Fox Theater, is, man. It's the best. 
It's the most beautiful theater. That's what happens when a billionaire says, I, we're not tearing this down and we're spare no expense. I mean, they flew in people from Italy. Yeah. To, to, to recreate those, the, the marble and, and the stuff. Because we don't, the artisans that built those places don't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of call for that kind of work. So not, not many, not as many people are going into those careers, you know, you know, but it's, yeah, it's so sure. beautiful. It's, it's, yeah. it's awe inspiring. Yeah. That's, that's an amazing theater. I've never been probably one of the most beautiful in the entire country. Really? I, I it's to me, you know. the Fox in Detroit is top of the heat. Um, yeah. I would say, and a great music town too, for great music town. Fox Theater, and it's big. It's like 4,500 seats. Mm -hmm. And um, the Fox in Atlanta is great. Um, I would say the Chicago Theater ha has a, a great charm. Um, Beacon's great. I mean, there's, there's so oh, many the cool, there's yeah, so the many cool ones. I mean, yeah. the Orpheum here in Los Angeles, um, Pantages. You know, I mean, like, it's, it's, it's literally, you know, it, it, you know, you go, Man, they used to sell these places out for movies. That's yeah, what right. They're built for movies. Crazy. <laughs> I saw Buddy Guy at the Beacon Theater. That was great. It's great. Yeah. yeah, fantastic. Totally awesome. So, how was uh, your most recent show? I think you played with Luke, right? I was at the Orpheum uh, with uh, uh, my friend Steve Lukather, and <clears throat> just a great day. As Colin Hay, uh, Hubastank, Stone Temple Pilots, um, and and. I got to back up a beetle at the very end, you know, yeah. Yeah, like, that's cool. You know, like, wow. There's that's Ringo, man. There's one and only, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. And it, and it was, it was great. It was all for the Ed Asner foundation. And, uh, you know, it was, it, it, it was fun. Uh, they, they, they were telling me I was playing too loud during soundcheck, but I <laughs> was kind of smiling. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I do? You know what I do? Like if they say I play too loud at soundcheck, I'll turn down, but I'll turn back up. Oh yeah, no, 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 no. That's not how this works. I control. And, and generally, when you do that, mm -hmm. they don't really even notice. They don't notice because once the whole place is filled with people, yeah. it doesn't it seem loud anymore. Yeah, right. yeah. I mean, I turned down because when we did the Hollywood Bowl last month, we tried turning down because of the orchestra, and uh, my sound guy Mike. Um, he, he's wonderful. He, he is, he is the ultimate high stage volume mixer. You know, I use shields in front of the amps. I'm not suicidal, but I use shields in front of the amps. They go as loud as they go. And all of them, all seven of them. And, uh, we turned down and, and I was like, Mike, how's the tone out front? He goes thin. And I go, yeah, I know it feels thin. Mm -hmm. And so I just said, screw it. I just went back, I went to all five of the amps, went dur, 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 to turn them up. And there it is. You know, it's that's at least for me how how it sounded. It's gotta, it sounded it's gotta be inspiring. It's gotta be inspiring the play, right? Yeah. This is why I don't use in-ear monitors because I, I like to find the sweet spot in every room. Um, I mean, for singing. In ears are great because that vocal is just literally like somebody tacked it to the front of your forehead. But for guitar, there's no sweet spot. So whatever you got, that's all you're getting. And a lot of times bands that consistently use in ears, the whole band, the deck sounds weird. You know, it's like it's like all you hear is drums or just a little boom of the bass. And, and like like you can't I've sat in with bands on, on ears. I mean, I can't, can't even get a pitch center because I'm not sure. Where they're at so i have to wear you know and it's it's just it's just a, it's a it's a way of doing it and but it's not the way i like to do it. i like to i like to blast but i like my stage to sound balanced so you can hear everybody yeah and and you know and and it's still i mean even though i'm a guy, I'm a guy with a blues blues on, on my hat you know it's still got a rock and roll man it's got a rock and roll not just rock you know yeah 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 man i agree so wholeheartedly <laughs> well look at look at look at the amps behind you i see a i see a what looks to be a uh, 50 watt plexi uh yeah. the brown face bandmaster with a harmonic tremolo which i love great we got a uh a jose modded marshall which is fun we got a high watt pa head converted to a dr 103 all of them and one of my amps <laughs> right all of them were designed 
to play, to play loud. gigs to play loud gigs now mm -hmm. we lived in a time not to i'm here here comes i sound like a grumpy old man and i am one we lived in a time when when artists said to themselves you know this 100 watt super lead really not moving enough air for me let's make a 200 watt you know <laughs> let's make a marshall major right that's now okay yeah that sounds okay and well you know i may be the guitar player in deep purple let's get three of those with six cabs <laughs> Easy to them together yeah that that's working for me you know okay i think i think we're properly balanced and my friend glenn hughes i used to see his, his rig at cal jam he had like four high watt 400 waters mm -hmm. enough cabinets to to build your own pa and that's what you play the bass through. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, you know, like now it's like people look at you like, like, like you're like, you're like Alf, like some sort of alien, you know? <laughs> I know. It's, it's sad the way it's gone. Um, so, uh, I mean, what do you do in a situation where they come to you or in any gig and they say, well, you know, we're, we don't want you to put amps on the stage. Luckily, I'm a solo artist. I've had this happen in Nashville when we when we um, when we when we rehearse, and we rehearse the same level as we play loud, all monitors. I have six wedges myself, and it sounds good. It sounds balanced, and I hear everybody. The drums are big, guitars got the same. I I I run sides, and I run guitars in the back, and I run vocals in the front, and the whole idea is I get the same amount of headroom no matter where on the stage I I. I move so the volume is reacting the same way you know so there's there's no dead zone so you're hearing it and 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 the guitar is also feeling the same thing that it feels right by the rig so there's you, there's feedback points there's there's all kinds of cool stuff happening we go into nashville we rehearse there pretty much exclusively now and like some of these players that play in big country acts They'll, they'll poke their head in and like, hi, you know, I'm so and so. I play with so and so. I'm like, hey man, you want to see the rig? Yeah, it's like we were hearing it outside. It's like, man, it sounds big and loud. And I'm like, okay, well, I'll show you. So I'll sometimes I do a little demo for them, and they 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 kind of go, oh my god. <laughs> they, they they go, they let you play that loud, and I turn to them deadpan. And I go, there's no they. <laughs> That's why I'm a solo artist. So. And I said, as long as Mike L is happy out front and it's not too loud for the for the fans, I'm happy because we have a deck that, in some cases, in the the circle of death, which is where I stand, it's sometimes in peak volumes, it's about 118. Okay, when I when you hit the front of the stage, they're able with the technology and the front fills and everything, because there's no direct blasting because of the shields, they they're able to get so the front row here is about 100, maybe 101 at peak volume. And we have a dynamic show, so it's not just one-on-one -on -one all night. It's am it's amazing what they do to to make it sound. It's like the tale of two 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 different worlds. Mm -hmm. And what I do is, if I'm gonna, you know, I try to be respectful, and I don't want to be the the person that just blasts like like obnoxiously. But you got to turn up enough to feel it. So I try to bring an appropriate amp for the situation that I'm in. And. And, and that 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 ranges from a high power twin. I have this little uh, dumbbell modded Vibrolux um, that that works well in a lot of scenarios. Like if I'm sitting in with Billy Gibbons at the Troubadour, it's it's got it's punchy enough to where it cuts through, but also you know it, it, it's not overwhelming. And also you know I use those pesky dials on my guitar called volume and tone. I just you know you don't have to, you don't have to be on ten all the time and so that's what I use, you know, it's like, it depends on the scenario and the situation, you know? Yeah. Right. 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 For sure. Um, so I'll be remiss if I don't mention this. So, uh, this is a while back. Um, your, your album that has uh, never say goodbye on it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and what's it called? And, and just Royalty. like that. That's, yeah. That's, that, that, that's, uh, uh, the album Royalty. That was, we were nominated for a Grammy. Were you? Yeah, yeah. It's the, the, well, the, 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 the third swing and a miss for me. My wife and I listened to that song very often for many years because I was leaving a job. Um, right. And 
that that anyway she told she's like you gotta mention that so i was like okay i'll mention it honey (laughs) (laughs) i i hate to even i can't believe i'm saying this but i i wrote that song with my friend the late great bernie marsden i can't believe i'm saying late Mm -hmm. great yeah but you know bernie was a real friend and 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 just just a real gem of a soul that's what i hear yeah he he and i wrote pretty much the entire a royalty album together and i never saw him happier than when we camped out at abbey road studios in london for a month both recording and writing and we'd be like going to work and the staff loved him be like, hey bernie welcome back and it was like it was like old home week you know we'd run into his old buddies and pink floyd and he knew everyone and and he and he was just a just a beautiful guy and and, and a great soul and it's a big loss he was way too young and you know, 73 is way too young, and, yeah. but, he, but he's a, you know, he'll, he made a, he made a big mark and touched a lot of people's lives um, with, with not only his friendship, but his music. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I never had the pleasure of meeting him, but um, uh, Jamie, who, you know, Jamie Kime, yeah. he said, he said he hung out with him once in, on a gig and he said he was the sweetest guy. Yeah. And it just, you know, he'd always come to our gigs early, like two o'clock, he'd hang with the crew, hang with us, you know, he'd sit in, bring the beast, you know, that was his 59 Les Paul, you know, standard that he bought in like 1973 for like 200. He goes, I paid 200 quid, you know, a lot of, it was a lot at the time. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, it was a lot at the time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Now it's a lot, lot. <laughs> oh, well, you know, it, it's like, you know, I'm I'm a collector of things. It's not. Yes, it's, you no, are. There's no the, the, there's no secret about that. Um, you know, as an okay, there's two sides. As a player, I, I'm seeing now that what you used to be able to do with stuff is like if hey you want to I, I see a Princeton Reaver behind you, Mark. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm gonna get a Princeton Reaver see if I like it. Well, you used to have to come out of pocket maybe a thousand dollars, twelve hundred dollars. That was full retail. Now they're thirty five hundred dollars. Cats can't swing that, you know, on a on a hunch, you know. Well, maybe a deluxe is more for me. Well, those are like forty five hundred dollars. Cats can't swing that. They it used to be a thousand or you know, fifteen hundred dollars. You know, like mar- vintage plexi. Let me try a vintage plexi. Well. We all have stories about our first plexi that we paid in the hundreds of dollars. Now, three hundred bucks. Exactly. I have one out in the studio. Three seventy-five, hundred watts. Let's go. Nineteen ninety-four. <laughs> you know, and but you could swing that, and it, even if you didn't like it, it wasn't gonna like. It wasn't like you, you didn't have to lose a thousand or twenty-five hundred dollars. Oh, you didn't regret it. You were just like, you okay. didn't regret it, and right. and if you if you sold it or you know gave it away it wasn't like breaking the bank now in 1990 i remember seeing my first like 59 les paul and i think it was priced at like like eighty five hundred dollars which was staggering right in 1990 because a a vintage strat would have cost you two grand maybe less and now they're in the hundreds of thousands of dollars and you better know what you're looking at because one mistake could cost you six figures if you're if you're wrong about something and and it's 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 harrowing so as a collector as an investment they've been great investments as a player there's real disadvantages now and i feel i feel bad for for people who are into old things who always wanted to 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 experiment musically with them which is what they're for that can't you know can't justify you know, $55,000 for a 57 Stratocaster, you know, because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, it's just the fucking Stratocaster. It's not going to, it's not going to sound much different than something you can buy new for a thousand bucks, you know, or less, right. you know, and, and that's, that's, that's the vintage market in a nutshell. It's, it's, be, it's become so elitist and this stuff trades among people who definitely, you know, are buying for 
you know, either investment wise or or doing it for the gram. You know, it's like, look what I got. Look how many I got. And I do this all the time. But people know I'm nuts and I'm and I've been doing this my whole life. Yeah, I put, I put guitars on Instagram, but it's not it's not about bragging. It's about sharing. I try to share some. Yeah, because we, we all love it. We love it. And it's an appreciation society is what I'm trying to start, you know. Um, but I'm lucky because I've had all this stuff for years and years and years and years, you know, and I really stopped buying a lot of stuff because of how painful it is. You know, I, it's it's there's a threshold of pain on everything. Now it's just crazy. It, it, it's it's beyond where I ever thought I'd see it again after 2006 and 2007. And, and, I, and I just when I, when I see eighty thousand dollars on a black card telly, I go, haven't didn't we not learn like 10 10 years ago, you know, or more now. It, it, it's like that when this stuff free falls, it free falls fast. And there's there's no telling where the, the bottom is. It's just, it's a supply and demand business. And if there's no demand and there's lots of supply, people go, you know, like, well, oh, that 55 strat is rare. Or the 57 strat is rare. It's not really. Leo made a lot of them. You know, he made a lot of amps. Made a lot of, a lot of tellies. Gibson made a lot of Les Pauls. They made few flying V's and few Explorers. So that's legitimately rare. And then the custom color stuff with right is very, you know, rare, especially from the fifties. But you know, rank and file stuff. You know, Sunburst Strat of any year, not really rare. They made, they made a lot. Mm -hmm. Do you ever sell stuff? Um, generally every year. Um, I read, uh, I read. I read something about uh, the, the the old CEO of um, uh, of uh, GE General Electric, and uh, he used to do it with people, which is horrible to say. But 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 he jettisoned the bottom ten percent of his employees, the lowest performing people every year, and 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 you know hired new people, and trying to raise the baseline. So what I do every year is I just take a good look at where I'm at. You know, and I probably, uh, you know, sell off maybe three to five percent of the collection that are, it's either redundancies, stuff that I'll never get to. And I'd rather just see somebody else play it and just stuff that, you know, I, I don't need or want anymore. Just, you know, and I, and I do that quietly. Um, it's not like a. I won't put it on the Instagrams, but right. you're not on reverb selling. <laughs> I think everybody, I think everyone, you know, has that, you know, they just, you just get tired of lugging it around, tired of looking at it. doesn't work. It's not working for you on a musical level. You know, if it's an amp that's been sitting around for 10 years, probably doesn't work, you know? Right. And they, and they just, you just get tired, you know? And, 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 or maybe like a lot of times in my case, something, very interesting or you know big will come around and be like i don't want to come out of pocket for it so i'll just i'll jettison some of this stuff and pay for something nice right yeah gotcha um Tra trading up so to speak yeah it's trading up without trading up and and yeah. and without you know doing an old-fashioned guitar show trade deal where you're like i'll give you this for that and 500 bucks you know i miss those those are fun you know <laughs> <laughs> no the deal's not done until both parties are unhappy about something, you know? And it's like, mm -hmm. it's old school. You mind if we uh, jump into some viewer questions? Sure. Okay. Jay Busk, what's going on? Thanks for the super chat. Joe, I'm 17 and would like to pursue a career in music. What would be the most realistic way? I don't want to live in my parents' basement at 45, pretending to be a rock star. Should I give up and do music on the side? Okay. So here's, here's, here's where I think musicians are at their most dangerous in a good way. When your back is up against a brick wall, you don't have any other option but to move forward. So I always say, I always tell people this, there's, there's, you know, when I was 17, I, was, I had a career, I've been doing this 35 years and I was transitioning from being in a band that was on a label to being a solo artist. I had to start at zero, zero. I was living with my parents and slowly but surely kind of just worked my way out of that. If I did one of those old fashioned, you know, you know, if my career doesn't take off 
by the time I'm 30, I'm going to join the FBI or whatever. If I did that, we wouldn't be having this conversation. I know some people, some of the viewers, be like, great, should have should have quit a long time ago. We have to deal with it. But my big break came four days before my 32nd birthday. You never know if you're not in the game or if you're doing it on the side, you'll, you chances are you'll never achieve what you want to achieve. I don't know anybody who's done it on the side that's ever gotten to where they want to be um, in their musical career. You have to go all in, no B plan, and just hit the ground running. And when you finally achieve what you've set out to do, that's when you prepare to really work hard. Getting there isn't the hard work. It's staying there is the, the hardest. That's I haven't worked as hard in my life since the years 2009 to present. Even all those years when I couldn't couldn't get arrested. Mm -hmm. It was there's nobody calling. There's nobody nobody wanted anything from me. They told me to quit. The music business wanted me dead. And I I, I have a list of people that I all know <laughs> that 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 see see sees where we're at now. And and listen, I, I know everybody's a skeptic, everybody's got advice, everybody <laughs> has has you know something to say when you're coming up, you know, going, well, maybe this isn't for you, blah blah blah. blah. And they and they flex and they do this to young musicians and it shatters your confidence and stuff like that. Well, I can tell you when you get to the top of the mountain and plant the flag and you look down at those people or chances are not in the business anymore, there's no better feeling in the world. So that's a great <laughs> spike is a great motivator. You know, yeah, it and is true. So if you're 17, there shouldn't be an iota of thought of doing it on the side. You know, yeah, yeah, maybe maybe not living in your parents' basement at 45 is a good thing. OK, that's that that's a good goal to set for yourself. But there are people that are working hard have to, you know, at, at 45 who are passionate about what they're doing and maybe haven't monetarily made a lot of money, but they're still in the game. So so I respect I respect the work and it doesn't matter where you end up at 45. It, 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 it matters if you're still passionate about what you're doing and not bitter and and jaded and whatever you know i think if you really want to do something you're gonna do it you know what i mean like if you're <laughs> motivated to do to be a success or do something you will become a success you know i mean i was obsessed with guitar tones and yeah. and and i've parlayed my career you know that was with hard work hard work um, it didn't get given to me oh yeah there, was no there wasn't yeah. There wasn't when you when you built your first amp, when Dumble built his first amp, when Leo built his first amp, there was no guaranteed outcome. I just doing it because I can't live with myself if I don't. Mm -hmm. That's that's the way that's the that's the way you get into these things, you know. Mm -hmm. And you're the people follow passion, enthusiasm, and authenticity. If you are that guy, if you are that person, then be that person. Don't pretend to be somebody else. Just be who you are, and people will follow it. What was that break when you were thirty-two? Because I mean, I've heard about you obviously when since you were a kid. We had worked our way up to one show one night at the Royal Albert Hall. It was the only show we did in England. We were getting popular in England, but it wasn't. It wasn't. You know, we were thousand seat popular, and we did the Albert Hall the first time, May fourth, two thousand nine. Eric Clapton comes out. We mm -hmm. record a DVD. The DVD hits PBS. And goes worldwide and explodes. Explodes. Next thing you know, overnight. Overnight. It was. It, I, I, when I say overnight, like like in in terms of glaciers. Okay. Overnight. I mean like six to eight months later. It was like, oh my god, mm -hmm. this thing is in, this thing's on fire. And if I did, if I quit at thirty, never would have got there. Right. Yeah. And that's yep. a, and that's a fantastic performance, by the way. It was the, it was, I always tell people, I'm not Jewish, but it was my bar mitzvah for sure. <laughs> like, it, was, it was, I was like, man, this is the biggest night of my life. And you know, a broken watch is right twice a day. I said, it's either going to be the beginning of the beginning or this is it. This is going to be my best moment. I'm going to tell, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, be in North Hollywood hanging with Dave Freeman and be like, you know, I, I remember that I used to, 
I used to play the Albert Hall once, you know, and like that was, <laughs> I, I was aware, I was very aware of the gravity of the situation. Yeah, very cool. Uh, 40 Grit, thanks for the super chat. Joe, uh, thank you for the term guitar safari. I'm buying the story, not the guitar. It mm -hmm. makes my shopping more enjoyable. Dave got my Jakey Lee and bought it from Motor City. Great am. Thanks. Awesome. Awesome. Enjoy. Motor City is a great, great store. Well, you know, uh, 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 all these things are a happy accident. Like the whole Nerdville thing took on a life of its own. You know how I came up with that? My my sister used to call me a nerd when I was a kid because that's all I wanted to do is play guitar and buy old junk. And we grew up in a town called Yorkville, New York. That was the, our local village. So I just married a term of endearment for my sister and 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 a ville. And I said, you know, what we should do we should make a sign. When I bought Keith's old house and Ollie's old house, I'm like. Let's make a sign. You know, I'm not married and 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 there's nobody nobody to say no. I'll just put a Vegas style sign that says Nerdville in my driveway. And then we started going from there. And then Reverb did a did a whole mm -hmm. like 2016, they did a whole film, like a 30 minute documentary. And when I watched that, I go, because because you know, I live here. Okay. This is this is you know, there's there's like 200 and some odd amplifiers in my house. Okay. Mostly tweed and they're well, they're well apportioned. They're, it's, it's organized hoarding, but people come over they're like, this is overwhelming. How do you deal with it? I go, I deal with it because I live here and I'm desensitized to it all, you know? And the guitar safari, it was just one of those things I said out loud or online my manager picked up on it. He, of course, you know, he likes the merchandise, and um, and he made some hats, camouflage hats, safari hats, and uh, it just took on a life of its own. And you know, I was approached by a couple of television networks about doing a show about guitar safari. And I said, listen, a couple of things. One it takes the fun out of it for me because that keeps me staying on the road, and B, you don't catch a fish every time you go fishing. So if you have a camera crew out for three or four days, they want they want results. And and with reality TV, we all know that reality TV is about as real as as Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. It's 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 you're living in a land of make believe. And this is this is one of those things where we'd have to plant stuff at stores to just get a narrative and a story going. And I go, that's about that's not authentic. And it's it's too much bandwidth. And, you know. You know, I, I like watching American Pickers and I like watching Antiques Roadshow and that would just siphon the joy out of it all. Knowing, you know, I want the hamburger. I don't want to visit the killing floor. I don't want to know how these things are done <laughs> with, with true or not. Just give me the burger. I don't want to, I, I don't want to, you know, visit the high density feedlots, you know, off the five, you know, <laughs> and, and, and you, everybody knows what it is. Where any, any California knows what that is. You know? Yep. And, um, I don't want to know anything about it. I don't want to see it. I just want the hamburger and and be done. Yep. And by the way, I love American Pickers. They find <laughs> great stuff. And by the way, I watched them go walk totally past cool vintage guitars and gear. Really? Yeah. I don't think it's in their wheelhouse. You know, yeah, I, think, yeah. I think they they do buy a couple of things. But they're more automotive and 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 you know Art Deco and they're more antiques mm -hmm. and motorcycle related than <clears throat> than the uh, guitar. Yeah, you should give them a call and say, "Hey, give you know, here's my number. Call me if you <laughs> put me in, Coach. I got you covered." Exactly. I have this weird. I have the, 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 the curse. It's a blessing and a curse. I can walk in the music store, no matter what condition it is, basement of the music store, or whatever, and my eyes immediately go to the most the rarest and the most uh the, the the item that's not for sale how much is that oh i'm not selling it, of course you know and then then the dance starts <laughs> you gotta like walk so and and then and then finally like you know here's an offer and it's usually a sign it's usually like a point of purchase sign that i don't have um because not only did i get the guitar bug the amp bug I also got the memorabilia bug. I got one of the biggest collections of guitar store memorabilia from the 50s and 60s, probably in the world. 
because I, I have this curse that I just, I have to inquire. And then it becomes like a, a game for me and be like, I, I got to get this. You know? Well, you're talking to a, a guy. I used to be a, a, a big comic book collector since I was a little kid. So, uh, yeah. You know, I've been doing that for a long time. So I understand the obsession. With, and what's your favorite uh, comic? It's the one you buy tomorrow. Right. It's the, it's the <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. One I bought today. Right. You know? right. It's the same thing with guitars. It's like, oh, this is the coolest thing ever. Put it back in the case, stick it in the guitar vault. All right. Now what? Next. Next time you're in Detroit, you are going to have to go see my friend at Motor City Guitar. I'll be there this fall. We have because there is a <laughs> secret stash of vintage guitars that he has locked away in a room that no one sees. Yep. And I'm sure he could be, if you like something, I'm sure he'd be coerced to sell it. <laughs> coerced you know you know um but uh he i've seen a you know just just a little smattering of a few pieces that he's pulled out and showed me and i'm like wow nice <laughs> well you know that's that's the thing it's like i know big collections bigger than mine you know sitting in warehouses you know, and yeah. I know man, if any of that stuff gets unleashed all at the same time it's gonna it's gonna be there's large collections around the world the stuff doesn't go anywhere it just changes hands you know well, norms i mean norm apparently has an insane collection right it, 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 i i mentioned this to him uh, a couple of weeks ago i said you know norm it's it's funny because you know he's been selling a secret stash off for years at one point when he went when he wasn't selling it off um i said man you were probably up there in the top four or five largest guitar collectors in the world get thousands of guitars you know album wall and arrow thousands of albert yeah you got like a 1200 piece collection and uh you know it's you know i know people that have i have 550 i know people that have almost double <laughs> of me which is insane 550 is insane <laughs> you know? it's a lot that's for sure what oh, you do? I mean, I'm looking at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven behind you, Mark. Seven. Oh yeah, and and that's just that's just one pick frame. That's like one that's, frame. That's, that's, <laughs> that's framing up the podcast. I mean, right. like so, it, it's not like you know the only person I ever know that, that I knew that 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 collected grand pianos was a guy named Ben Folds. Uh, you remember the band Ben Folds Five? Yeah, 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 yeah. Very successful solo, brilliant piano player. He 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 took over RCA Studio A um, in Nashville on Music Rose, the Chet and Lester room. And his, this live room was huge. I mean, he had, I think, 10 or 12 grand pianos mm -hmm. in the room. And it was still enough for our whole back line, road cases, crew boxes. And it was it was insane. He collected pianos. There's not many piano collectors, not as many piano collectors as guitars. You know, same thing with cars. You know, it's like it, it, cars leak. They're big guitars, man. They just yeah, it's easy. To yeah, stack it's easy. Two hundred in a room. You know. Yeah, I mean, you yeah, could be like Ing, you could be like Ingve and just throw them all in a corner. That's one <laughs> way to do it. Yeah. You know, you know, you know, it's seventh one in the back. Right. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of grand pianos like that, I had the pleasure of, of you know, uh, I think we were at Tomon. Mm -hmm. uh once and uh a friend of mine was with me and he there he saw near where we were doing a video he saw this room of pianos you know that was locked it's like uh, can i go in and check those pianos i didn't even know he's a guitar player i didn't even know at the time he's actually also plays piano mm -hmm. and he went and these are all restored all vintage like pianos and stuff from different ear you know kinds brands different but all grand pianos and he went to each piano and he played the same little ditty on every single piano and i was just sitting there watching and listening <clears throat> holy crap is there a difference between all the pianos you know just like this it's like this one is bright and sparkly sort of sounding and this one's really woody and darker and oh yeah beefier and and it, it was amazing to actually just have the pleasure of hearing them all in one spot you know same room yeah. you know you know, you know, I, I always I always say not all fifty nine Les Pauls were created equal. Oh, some absolutely are, not. There there are some that just explode. There's some that are look beautiful and just lie there, 
you know, can't get mm-hmm. anything like punching sand, you know. Yeah. Even and the so, pickups, the pickups just are, are yeah. radically different from one set to another. Mm. And you know, same thing with Stradivarius. Strads are all different. You know, mm-hmm. just just depends on. You get a magic one. It's 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 it, there's nothing better. There's absolutely nothing better. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, Waterford Giant. I don't think you have a question, but appreciate it. Uh, Jay Busk, have you guys had an experience with the hybrid martial artist 3203 from the 80s? It was sort of a lower wad, wad, wattage budget JCM 800. I, I've seen the amp, but I've never. I don't have an experience. I have. It. What do you think? Uh, Rusty Anderson used to have one. I, if I do believe that he used to use for a lot of years. Hmm. If I'm thinking it's the same amp, and it was actually really cool sounding. It was a great sounding little amp. Hmm. I still have two. But, you know, I have a really interesting story. And this is going to get back to him. I don't care. It's too old, too whatever. Um, I, uh, in 2008, Marshall came to me and said, hey, listen, um, we'd, like to, we'd like to do a, a, a Joe B signature. And I said, oh, I'm a Jubilee guy. Let's do oh. it. Let's do it. At the time, they didn't make the Jubilee. Oh. I said, no, no, we want to do like a, a, a single 12 combo. And I said, well, I got these artists models i had a head and i had 112 cabinet which i thought sounded really good i thought the 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 112 by the way the 112 jubilee is a star it's big power in a small box that's it's a star so the 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 the, the, was it the 3203 whatever the artist series the 25 Mm -hmm. the 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 the, yeah 30 3203 80s sound almost like jubilees because it's 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 I think a light base distortion the, in the front end or whatever, whatever I, you, you would know better than I mm-hmm. would. Dave. And so I sent them the amps and they completely flaked out. Not once, but twice. They, they flaked out on the, on the, on the artist models and never gave them back. And then when they relaunched the Jubilee, they came to ironically, Henry the eighth castle. I was doing a gig there with Beth Hart in London. He said, we want you to do, we want to do a Joe B Jubilee. I said, I'm your guy. That's what I use, right? Completely flaked out again. That was the last I heard of him. So somewhere in Milton Keynes are my two Marshall uh, the, the artist series that, that were going to be some sort of signature model that never happened. So um, one of these days I'll get them back, but that's like 15 years. Maybe they sold them. I think the Marshall, I think the company sold. Yeah, the company sold a Z, Z, what is it, Zounds? Something like that? Yeah. Dave, right? Marshall, they yeah, are something like that. They are, they, they are great amps and they're affordable. You know, it's, it's, it's a nice package in a small box. Yeah, it was cool. I haven't heard one in a long time, but. I think they had reverb too. They had some like, like one spring. Maybe. But, but they were, they were, they were good. They were a good package and, and, but still way too loud for today's standards. <laughs> you just be run out of town so loud uh sloppy fingers joe after watching your demo one for uh guitar world thanks for making me drop a ton of dough on a 54 p90 gold top les paul reissue mark it's a lefty oh sweet uh david sounds amazing into a friedman pink taco thanks guys awesome thanks. very cool i'm happy to enable you <laughs> What do you, I, I was actually going to ask this, Joe. So, I mean, you obviously have a huge collection of amps. What, yep. what do you do about tubes? Um, and what are your favorite tubes? I, uh, RCA black plates? Okay, so here, here's, here's what I do. Is if the amp has vintage tubes and it's, and it's working great, leave it. It's not a problem until it blows up. I never went down the rabbit hole of... of old glass versus new glass. Hmm. And I'll tell you why. Um, because I know sonically, like you were mentioning RCA, you know, uh, black plates and, and, and GEs and all, all the Mullards and, uh, oh yeah, they do sound superior than to, to what they, what they're making. Problem is when you're on the road and you're in your best amp or one of your amps has old tubes in it, and it goes out and you have to replace them with JJ's or whatever, um, uh, you know, electro harmonics or whoever makes the tubes, you may not get the same amp back 
with the new tubes as you did with the old tubes, or you have to go broke and buy tons of these new old stock stuff that may or may not last. So I tune the entire rig to new, new tubes. We use JJ's in the Marshalls. Um, I think we use JJ's and everything, even the Dumbo stock. And um, I find that they bias really well and they sound fine to me um, because it, that is a rabbit hole that you could easily fall. Into. Yeah, it 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 makes a difference, but yes and no. I mean, you know, and you can't you can't replicate it. So if you're touring and you're trying to use amps, you need to use what's available. And, you know, I I've wholeheartedly agree with that way of looking at it. Yeah. And, and yeah, a new old stock set of Mullers and a JTM 45 unbeatable harmonically it's it, you know now if you're using that amp in the studio great because it's not being tossed around what you have, you have to realize is the an, old amps or new amps or whatever amplifiers don't like to be moved right after they did two hours but that's what happens either if you're opening for someone you're getting shoved off to the side you know my rig um there's a cool down period like you know but still i know those those marshals and 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 tweed twins and and the dumble stuff they go into the case is hot i know that and occasionally you knock off a tube takes out a grid resistor and it's there that's standard operating procedure with traveling with as many amps as we we we, we travel with you know and I, I try to have spares in case it goes down during the show and there's a second set of marshals in case something goes down you know there's 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 some redundancy in the rig but as far as general you know, using old glass on the road, I just, I, I don't find it pragmatic and, 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 you know, yeah, I would agree. Win in, in the long run. Okay. Uh, Y M E S. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Joe, could you talk about the business side? I'm a guitar singer, songwriter in the world of contract negotiations, booking, what team you need around you. I'm not sure where to learn all of that. Okay. Um, you know, I don't have an agent. I don't have a booking agent. We do it. We do it in house. Oh wow! I don't have. I don't have a a a, 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 a merch person in in the sense that we have a fulfillment company. We do all the merch in house. You know, I don't have a concert promoter because we promote all our own shows. We make our own records, and and basically we're uh, with the the in the business terms of vertically integrated, meaning everything's under one roof. And you know, yeah, is it. Is it cool to go to the Chateau Marmont and some hip Hollywood party? I never go to that shit anyway. Anyway, but 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 in theoretical world, um, and say, yeah, I'm I'm signed to William Morris Endeavor. I got a deal with Capital. Blah blah blah. That is in 2023 is a recipe for disaster. To the point where sometimes people will flex in Nashville and be like, oh, I just signed with Sony Music. Blah. blah, blah. I'm sorry to hear that. Okay, and I can tell you that check that you get is the last one unless you become the next taylor swift that's that's a guarantee you know there's not many testimonials about labels that people have been on labels for 20 30 years and say man that's the greatest th thing we ever did you know there's a, there, conversely there's a lot of people go had their careers completely destroyed so if you're if you're a singer songwriter okay if you are whatever guitar player, that doesn't matter. It's, we're in the entertainment business, giant umbrella. Mm -hmm. You have to think in terms of charity starts at home and you need to cut out as many people that are unnecessary in that chain as you can. Like, yeah, do you need an agent when you're starting out? Absolutely, okay? But once, once you start, you want to be very clear about your intentions. Like, I want to own this lock, stock, and barrel. I want to own my master recordings. I want to, I want to own my touring business. I want to basically say, I want to work here, and this is how I'm going to do it. And the only way to do that is to do it yourself. You're not, you're not, you're not adherent or or reliant upon anyone's job, career, enthusiasm. You know, you have to believe in yourself because it's extremely difficult to get people to believe in you if you don't believe in yourself. It's impossible. Nobody's going to bet on you. So you have to have this kind of quiet confidence going, I don't care who's around me. 
this is where we're going and this is what we're doing. And I've been lucky enough. I've been the same manager 33 years now. Um, and, and you know, I mean, it's like we've had this journey together based on the word no and quit. Like that was the narrative from, from, you know, Madison Avenue label crowd. It was like, what are you kidding me? Weird last name, long chin, uh, can play guitar, but it's blues rock and everybody wants to sound like so-and-so, so-and-so, blah, blah, blah. It was the, the laundry list of why nots. And we just said, well, why not? Why not? You know? And, and our thing was, we're going to invite ourselves. And if you don't want to invite us to your party, we'll throw our own party. And that's what we did. Step and repeat 30 some odd years. Wow. And it was 17 years of, of famine and, 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 and equal amount of time of, okay, this worked out. And it, 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 because we believed in ourselves when nobody else would. And now, mm-hmm. you know, you know, you, you get the inevitable people like, you remember me from 25 years ago? I, I, I've been believing in you since, but I'm like, no, you weren't. Stop saying that. You're insulting me and my intelligence and I don't suffer fools, you know, because I because I'll just say it out loud. I'm, I'm a crazy character. I'm like, I just like, no, you didn't just stop saying it. it's, it's cool. I'm, I'm good. We're good. I'm right. Sorry. Right. Just don't just don't bullshit me. Don't bullshit me. OK, because the Italian in me goes, OK, we're done. I, I just I could not, <laughs> I just not going to sit there and go, oh, yeah, man, thanks for believing. I'm such a you know, gay <laughs> team. No. Right, right, right. Well, thanks for that. Um, Mr. Anderson, thank you. Hey, guys, Joe, two questions. If you had a time machine, which guitar, guitars, amps uh, you would you not sell, if any? And what part of your technique learning process would you correct or maybe approach differently? Um, well, interesting you asked that. When I moved from New York to Los Angeles 20-some-odd years ago, 21 or whatever, I had some guitars. I had a 62 335 that I bought from Elliot Michael in the 90s for like $3,000. I like I sold everything to get this thing. And and I sold it to move to LA to just get the money together, you know? And I sold that and I sold a few other guitars that I don't miss. Last year, maybe a year, year and a half ago, I get a call from my friend Jason who works for Bob Dylan. He sends me a photo. He goes, check your check, you know, we're on the phone. I'm going to check your text. And it's the 335 that I sold to move to LA. And I always regretted selling it because it was just a, it was just, it was my guitar. You know, I did my first solo album on it. And it was like, it was like, I mean, it had a tremolo on it, but I took it off. So I wanted it to look like Clapton's and mm-hmm. whatever. And I bought it back. And I got it back after all these years. And, and then FedEx loses it and delivers it to another house. Oh. You spend two or three days looking for that. And that's that was probably the one that I regretted most, but I ended up getting it back. Oh, that's and great. I'm not sentimental about my past as far as like, well, I use this on this record. Or I use it. It's like I, 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 I'm not sentimental. Like all the guitars that I play in the Albert Hall all have gone to other homes because I have this horribly expensive addiction that requires funding at time in, 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 at times to 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 feed the beast, you know, like these bursts, you know, these bursts are not cheap. They've never been cheap. So, you know, and I got 15 of them. So it, it's crazy. So sometimes this stuff has to go in order to get other stuff in. But anyway, that was that was the one I regret. As far as the technique is concerned, I've long been at peace about my my journey, you know, I used to regret this and I used to regret that, you know, if I had to do it over again, I'd do the exact same thing. I'd do the exact same thing because, you know, it's worked out and, you know, I'm at peace with who the kind of player that I am, the music that I make, it, it, all of it. it. It took me a long time and it only until recently did I not, you know, was I not riddled with just regret after regret. Mm-hmm. Uh, more guitars, best interviewing guest. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Saw you at Ovens Auditorium here in Charlotte. Looking yeah. forward to it again. Are you still using Jubilees Live? And I was curious why why you select using Jubilees as well. I like the Jubilees because as far as a preempt Marshall, I always found him to be the least buzzy 
of the lot. Hmm. Like 800s and Jubilees were were the last of the the, the non buzzing ones. Once they went to the 900s, then that's you know they the Jubilees had a nice mid range, um, and the the so live I still use them. I used my original Jubilee that I bought in 1994 at the Buffalo Musicians uh, 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 Swap Meet. And this guy from Toronto, Canada drives down and he's got a Canadian import Jubilee. It's got the, it's got Canadian uh, 800s and Jubilees had a, a, a physical switch on off switch, not the plastic one. It was like a, like a yeah, like big a metal one. one and a square pilot light, almost like on a plexi. Mm. And yep. it was just a Canadian import uh, thing. It was something to do with their, their equivalent to the UL and some, some whatever. Correct. Um, mm-hmm. Sorry, my, uh, my my lanterns just turned on. Um, so he starts he starts off at six hundred dollars, which is full retail at the time. Walks it around, it's heavy. It's a hundred watt, and I offered him four. He he, I'm at my father's booth, and I was like, I'll give you four hundred bucks. No, no, that's too low. Okay, he walks around, does another lap. He goes, Would you do five? And my dad goes, No, it's four hundred. Right, walks it around again. This is the third lap around. It's getting heavy. No offers. No offers. Getting heavy. <laughs> and uh, puts it down in front of me. He goes, give me the $400. And I was like, see, I told you. Because, you know, <laughs> twice as large. And I was like, so I've been using that amp just about on every record, for the exception of maybe four or five, um, my whole life. So I still use that live. I have a second silver one. And then the spares I use. Uh, 2550. I have a nice pair of uh, 2555s, which is basically the, it's the same as the Jubilee. It's just the 1988. It wasn't an anniversary model. It's just 2555. Mm-hmm. And I and I probably I have I have two rigs, a B rig, and I, that's got you know. So I probably have 10 Jubilee heads that are in rotation, spares and stuff like that. And um, I I love them. I I think it's a great effects loop. Takes the delay and the Leslie pedal really well. And they, I cut them with with different mid range drivers. That's been my my trick the whole time. Is the Marshalls do the high and the low and and the gain. In the middle of that, I run the the the, the high power Tweed Twins, which are more narrow, more focused, but open, kind of like a Fender. Well, it is a Fender. Then I then I pair them with the Dumbles, two two sets of. Them. So the 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 combo Dumbles do a very very hyper focused dark mid-range that live in the middle of the, of the jubilee frequency and that's that big fat dark solo-y tone that i use and then i use a second patch dumble which is just like a driven fender amp so it's not i'm not on the over i'm not on the overdrive section i use a clean but with evs and so it barks and that's really hyper articulate if i'm if I suck on a particular evening, I will not be hitting that setting because it, it requires some some articulation and some capable playing on my part. And that's okay. it. And my my trick with the Marshalls, and I know I'm such a contrarian and counterintuitive to, 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 to what popular belief, is I use EV12Ls with the Marshalls and I use Celestian 80 watt speakers with the, with, with the Fenders and the Dumbles and, and, the, and, the, and the solo uh, sound Dumbles. It's just to my ear, the EVs clean up the Marshalls, make them stouter on the bottom. You don't get that kind of cone cry fuzzy thing with the Celestians. And I find that Fender-based amps love Celestians. It brings out the mids. They're they're more um, they're more efficient. They're louder. They see you put a mic in front of them. It, it it's like nice and big and fat. Dave, you've been saying that for a while. To put a green back in a you know, like in a Princeton or something, or in a Deluxe or something. Yeah. Yep. Mike Landau always did that. It's a different amp, it t- oh, yeah. you know. You know, different- I like how they distort better. If you're going to distort them, I think I like I like the Celestians much better than say a Jensen or something. Uh, at least that's for me. At least, at least how I want the distortion to be. Jensens are loose. They're very the the, mm-hmm. the beat amps are very very loose. I mean, you put a you put a, a an old Celestian or a new Celestian into a Tweed Deluxe, man, it's 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 cranking. It's mm-hmm. really it's 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 what you want to hear. That's cool. Um, we've got, speaking of Norm, uh, L. Scott Music, thank you. Hey, Joe, thanks so much for being here. Could you talk a little bit about your friendship with Norm Harris and how many guitars you've gotten from him? <laughs> that might be private. 
I have probably purchased from my friend Norm 50, 60 um, over the years. Amos came from Norm. A lot of, lot of really nice stuff. Um, the broadcaster just came from Norm. I just bought a really nice Firebird uh, Cherry Red that he came Ooh. out of his stash. I um, saw that. I saw that video the other day. Kelly came from him. Uh, some mint 335s and stuff like that. Um, I'm very lucky to have a friend like Norm. Norm is a Norm is family to me. We, are, we people people legitimately think he's my uncle, but he's not. But 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 he is like my uncle, you know. And you know the thing about Norm is what you don't see is his philanthropy, like his support of not only musicians, the homeless. The homeless here in Los Angeles. We've done some crazy benefits for the Midnight Mission. Our friend Donnie's house up in Oxnard. Like it was like wild, you know, like like rich guys bidding on guitars and we're playing and you know, and raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for the Midnight Mission, which is a great organization here in Los Angeles that 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 helps the homeless, feeds the homeless, and shelters the homeless, and they ask nothing in return. You know, it's all donated. And they say each meal costs them a dollar. So if you raise, if you go, you know, we normally organize these, these charity things. And we, I go up there and play with either, you know, like, I don't think, I think Josh did one and uh, Josh Smith and, um, you know, a guy King did a couple and, and, you know, uh, Rick Vito and raise all this money. And he gives it all, you know, all the money goes to, to the Midnight Mission. I, I've been in his store in December, just as recently as last December. I walk in and there's like a hundred, like, you know, student model acoustic guitars that he's bought himself, ordered, purchased himself, that he's given to the Midnight Mission, you know, as either a donation for people to play or, or, or you know, or, or he's given, he gives them to kids. You know, I've watched him take, amps just hand it to a player just be like hey man but i've been lucky and pass it forward and that's and great that's that's the kind of guy he is and there's not a lot of people like that in the in the in the vintage guitar world you know i mean that like that, that that generous you know i'm lucky enough to be friends with a, a bunch of those kind of people that have been very generous and it's not about the bottom line it's about paying it forward and I've learned that lesson, you know, over the years, um, because I'd rather give something to someone who's going to use it than sell it to them. Like, mm. Here's, here's take it. I, I, you know, I've been look, look at me. I'm I, I'm some like blues rock idiot with a weird last name, living in the Hollywood Hills, one of the biggest guitar collections in the world. If I'm not the luckiest sob in the world, <laughs> I, I, I don't know who is. So so that's that's my mentality, and it always has been because. I just, I never want to be, I, I never want to be a taker. And I learned that from Norm. Don't be a taker, be a giver, pay mm -hmm. it forward. And, and, and good things will happen with that. Not only to that person that you're paying it forward to, but also to your, to, to yourself. Yeah, it's and good karma. Things it's, it's, it's karma. I believe yeah. in it. Yeah. I do believe in it also. Absolutely. Um, cars in depth. Thank you. Once asked George Grun if Leo could imagine people treating strats like Cremona violins, and he said they were vac factory goods made on an assembly line. Well, that's true. George likes a certain type of guitar. Um, I've known George a long time. He's a great guy, one of my friends, and loved speaking to him. He is an encyclopedia of, you know, especially acoustic guitars. Um, Solid body electrics. I don't think you know he's he's dealt some of the best in the world. I mean, I bought the Howard Reed Strat from him, which mm -hmm. is my dream guitar when I was eleven years old. And it came up for sale in twenty thirteen, and I bought that. So you know, again, would we ever th have thought that a Les Paul made in Kalamazoo, Michigan, would be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars? Nobody, nobody ever thought that would be. But here we are. And yeah. I think values, and we, we ever thought a tube amp made in 1983 by a boutique amp builder in, in North Hollywood uh, would be worth $200,000? No. You know, I mean, it's the, the Dumble thing is, you know, 
So Got the crazy. logic, the logic in predicting what's going to be value, it it's really about the relevance that these things have generations after they were invented. It's like, it's like, why is a sunburst less Paul, a sunburst less Paul worth so much and not a gold top with P90s? Because Jimmy Page played one. End of story. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, you know, Robin Ford, you know, and Larry Carlton and Lowell George. It's like, why are Dumbles these mythical things? It's because everybody chased the Robin sound for years. And then that's what he was using. It, you would you would hear these things. It's like, well, my, my Les Paul is a 59 or my 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 amp is I, I use these amps by this guy, Alexander Dumb. It's like and then and it puts the bug in everybody's ear. And it'd be like, well, what is that? You know, and you see it with Friedman amps now. Everybody, you know, I mean, you, you that they're all over. And and in it, it it's because what you're building, Dave, is is relevant to this music that people are playing. And that, that's gonna ensure that they, they hold their value over the years. So, you know, I'm sure there's a holy grail sousaphone, but that music is not prevalent now, you know. Right. And it's because of the legacy of the Beatles, the legacy of ZZ Top, Led Zeppelin, Joe Walsh, everybody who's played these things is why they're so valuable now, because everybody's chasing the sound that they heard on those records and thinking it's going to be the sound of them as well. You know, if I, if I, the little known fact in all of this is the most, the, 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 the biggest factor in your sound are these mm -hmm. and if you don't yeah. it, it all starts here and the tools are just i gotta go from point a to point b this this set of tools makes it easier for me to go to point a to point b that's it mm -hmm. yep. yep uh brandon, brandon thompson West. thanks for the super chat don't see a question though uh vipas patil hey joe i uh, really got into a hard hardtail strats because of you apart from the bridge what makes them different tone wise also can you talk about what, what makes the pickups in the bonnie strat so special um the bonnie strat is a 1955 hardtail beat to hell that i got from trevor boone at emerald city guitars another one of the the good guys in the vintage business who pays it forward him and his father jay he calls me up in 2013 or something like that he sends me a photo and he says he's like man i got i just got the coolest vibiest 55 strat in the world i'm like wow it's a big statement so he sends it to me and I paid him, but from the downbeat, there was something in this thing that had an extra 5%. So I had Joe Glazier put a fret job on it and I've been playing it almost a thousand shows. And I like hardtails because two things, one, I do think they sound different. I think it's a direct connection from the body through the, up through the strings you don't have the spring. You don't have the. You don't have the, the springs. Conversely, Eric Clapton prefers the trem model, but doesn't use the tremolo. I've read that, and so hardtails tend to have this thing, especially on the bridge pickup, where they they kind of sound like blackguard tellies. They just have this kind of extra punch, and it's a nice, sweet high end. It's not that kind of ice pick. That's and a little fatter. It's a little fatter. And I don't use the tremolo, so, and generally, historically, hardtails have been cheaper to buy than trem models. The one thing you do have to notice about a hardtail strat, and I, and I tell this to everybody, um, sunglasses at nighttime, I, I don't know how much more pretentious that I can do um, <laughs> at this point. So what I do tell everybody is, is when you're looking at a hardtail strat, now, fenders are intrinsically bolted together. Sometimes necks get swapped. I've seen hardtails with necks on that say with synchronized tremolo. And conversely, I've seen tremolo models with logos that don't say with synchronized tremolo. If that, if that happens, that's not that, that body and that neck didn't start off on the same guitar. They've been oh. the, the neck swap. And, um, you know, they're just, they're just good strats. You know, I like the fifties ones because I'm, I'm a maple neck guy. And plus I just like yeah. the way the patina looks on it when it gets all that. Oh yeah, Mark yeah. So. I prefer maple necks myself. I would. So do I. This. So do I. Yeah, I mean, you know, I know, I know it sounds dated, 
But like I'm a sucker. I, I like maple neck 50 strat sunburst because it's the butt my, my buddy Holly moment. And I like Olympic white or blonde 62, 63 strats because it's the Al Jardine. It's like yeah, you know, maple. You know, there you go. And that's all you need. You can rule the world with that thing. Yeah. Yep. Uh we've got Michael Torin. So we got Rackville. Um which uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of uh, Michael Torin, but he he's your competitor. Um, if you ever want to get into rack gear, he's a rack. He's Rackville. He I'm has every rack. known guitar preamp that was ever made, and power amps. And power and amps. Yeah, just it's in, actually insane. Bass, bass preamps. Yeah, he's, <laughs> but, but, but yeah, it's he's literally has you walk in. It's like NASA. It's just I bet, I bet you he he doesn't have this one thing though. What's do you that? know do you know Dumble made a rack ODS? I mean like two of them. My friend wow. Frankie from Survivor has one. It's basically a tube rack mountable front end of an ODS. And then there was there was a separate head that would go on top like an Odyssey. Is that, that the one that's for sale right now? There's one there's one sale. here in town. Right. And and right. then there was one on Reverb for a long time, and uh, my friend uh, uh, Frankie Sullivan from Survivor, he he has it, and it's the coolest thing in the world because it's like you're looking at it going, that's an ODS in a rack. Uh, I think Dean Parks had a, a rack mountable ODS as well. So, not not to spend your money, Michael. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not I'm not trying to spend your money. All right, so rotary rotary speakers, best chorus in the world. Leave it on slow. And I had a Mesa Boogie revolver when I was a kid, and I got rid of it. Um, it's too big. I couldn't. And when I put the new rig together, I wanted to do a, a rotary speaker. And Chris Benson built me a one with a 12, and that's in the B rig. Of all the stuff that I carry on the road, all of it, guitars, Sunburst Les Pauls, Dumbles, all of it, the rarest part of my rig is the Mesa Boogie revolver. That took a couple of years to find, hmm. literally a couple of years. There's not many of them. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it's only local delivery. So if you find one, it's in Florida. It's not, you're not getting that. And um, I got the last one that Mesa Boogie had in their warehouse. I called Gibson when they bought them. I said, hey, do they have any revolvers? And they had one and they shipped it to me. And, uh, and the problem with revolvers is the, 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 was it the PC board or the circuit board? Um, a lot of times those over the years fail and the thing gets stuck on fast. So you kind of have to go in. We had to replace the, the circuit board. Luckily they had an extra one um, in this one that I have. And it's been, it's been fine ever since. Um, but it's a such an over-engineered Leslie. It's an actual yeah. speaker that's, whipping around in there it's not a baffle it's a the the, the black spins. widow spins hmm. but it's a great chorus and if i don't have it in the rig i notice it doesn't seem to move the needle a lot on stage but if i know if i don't have it i go yeah it's not there's something missing and it's oh, and it's nothing interesting now those are cool uh billy joe thanks for the super chat hey joe i bought a 50s gibson ga20 a few months ago and absolutely love it what are your thoughts on those old gibson amps uh good enough for ry cooter good enough for me you know um he used the ga20 i think he had a ga50 um i i like gibson amps um leo's stuff was just so dominating at the time that gibson amps got overshadowed but they made some really really cool you know um amplifiers the ga40 is a deluxe killer uh, the 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 les paul branded amps um the 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 you know the, the vanguard which is a single 15 it's almost like a 115 pro um the the rvt 79s the the stereo they look like tv console little stereo consoles great because they had this thing where the reverb return was on its own preamp so you could actually have the reverb coming out of one side and a dry signal coming out the, the other side mm -hmm. and blending it together. So it was like wet, wet, dry, you know, and it sounds amazing because the reverb, the reverb return is coming out of one side and the, the crunch and everything else is yeah. coming out. Of it. And I, 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 I think they're great and they're very undervalued. 
you know, not that every anything needs to get more expensive, but but you know, if you're looking for a, a, a vintage amp that that ticks the boxes and will go up against any tweed, save yourself thousands of dollars. You can buy a Gibson amp. You know, it's like yeah, it's so they may, cool. and they may they may eventually appreciate. So I hope I hope I hope it all just stays the same or or comes down. At least they have go have some fun. You know, yeah. Like, I'm, tired, I'm tired of looking at two thousand dollar blackface champs. Tired of it. It's like yeah, it's crazy. Much. It too is. Much. Yeah, it's uh, just yeah, champ. You're a champ. You're looking at this little lamp and it's two thousand dollars, and you're like, yeah, never mind. <laughs> I know it's. It's, it, it, it is. It's a five it's five one amp. You know, it's like it's like, you know, it's like it. The, they're good, but they're four hundred and fifty dollars good. You know, it's yeah, not, right. not two thousand dollars. Yeah. There's a question for Dave. Dave, did you ever work on Eddie Van Halen's '63 Blonde Bandmaster? No, I've heard about it, but I've never seen it, and I don't know if it even exists anymore. Hmm. So, thanks for the question, Chad. But now I'm going to ask someone about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, music therapy, Laz. One doesn't need to know how the souffle is made to enjoy it. Great show, guys. Oh, that's true. That's true. Thank you. Uh, I've told Marty at Motor City to do a YouTube channel on the collection. Uh, so Joe's going to have to check that out. Um, Joe, I'm mainly a rock fan, but considering how many blues artists, studio albums, and live albums, I barely scratch the sur surface. I tend to get option paralysis when having so much music to discover. Any tips? Um, I, I'm with you. I, I, totally, I totally agree with that. There's so much content now. It's, it's impossible to... It's impossible to to wade through it all. Um, the only thing I th say about listening to music and and all of that is 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 this is there are certain records that I want to play over and over again, and there are certain records that are perfectly fine, but I only want to listen to once. So you just the ones that you gravitate towards, you know, check it all out, try to check it all out, but then and then just gravitate to the stuff that moves you, you know, and and wow. you know it's I mean there's thousands. I was it. 30,000 titles a month come out. I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm, that's bullshit, but, but there's a lot. There's thousands of records that come out every month on streaming. You know, it's, it's impossible to wade through it. It'd be a full time job 24 yeah. 7. Yeah, absolutely. Fixed pedal boards. Thank you. Shazam. Thanks, no question, he said. I'm just a welder from Palmdale after all, just enjoying the show. Hey, thanks, Tim. Thank we appreciate it. Uh, Dylan Farrell, Joe, I'm from Canada, moving to Nashville in December. I've been making a living as a musician most of my life. Uh, do you have any advice for building a career in the States? Does that any, does it, uh, differ from the advice you gave before? Uh, would love to be playing festivals and KTBA crews. Yeah. Well, um, the advice I would give, uh, you know, Nashville's crowded in, in, in that, but you know, if you can go in there and make a name for yourself um, and you just got to get, you got to get out there and pound the pavement, do gigs, take anything, you know, and it's that same in Canada. You know, you got to just take anything when you, when you're getting started and people, next thing you know, people start talking about you and, and you, your reputation grows, you know, there it is competitive. It's a little clicky Nashville. I, I hope they don't mind me saying that it is clicky because it is. And and generally, I know the people that from California that moved from Los Angeles to Nashville generally generally found that the word no is the same in Nashville as it was in, in Los Angeles. So you, you've got to be well, well aware that that that, you know, to jump into the deep end of the pool is is going to require some effort. And you just got to get there and go, you know, don't take no for an answer. Just just and don't let anybody try to bring you down, you know. And, and, you know, I'll, I'll give you a couple of, of Nashville code uh, things that, that I've learned over the years. Like, like you know, um, you know, y'all come back, you hear that's I never want to see your fucking face again. Um, <laughs> bless your heart. That's go fuck yourself. So so just be mindful of the southern charm. <laughs> It's true. It's true. Yeah. It's, it's true man. I, it is so true. I was like, y'all come back. I like, and it's like, it's I'm like, is, this, is that passive aggressive? But there's some wonderful folks there. And I, I've made some great friends and I love, I love <laughs> the main time there, but there's a couple of pitfalls that you got to just mind. Cause they, they're leery. Yeah. About, the ones that have been there for years, the leery outsiders and rightfully so, because they, they, they took their quiet little town 
And now, I mean, the, the, they say the state bird is a crane, not not the bird, but a, a, a crane. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> the, the, I, live, I live downtown. I swear to God, I'm I'm sometimes I'm three four months and I I, 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 I I don't go there, and I go, I just get back home. I'm like, when did that building go? When did that? And it's all it's it's all mixed real estate, kind of like condos, hotel, retail on the bottom, and it's just like yeah. it, like it, it, it the city itself yeah has exploded. And and it's you know in the traffic it's kind of like that road that Austin took like in the '90s when Dell moved there and 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 mm -hmm. it went from a cool like hippie Texas town to like a grand metropolis and that's where Nashville's really headed for for sure. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Um, how you doing on time, Joe? You got a few more minutes to stay. I got with a few it? more minutes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. I gotta watch Jeopardy. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Uh, cars in depth. Any vintage solid state amps that Joe likes? Lab series. Yeah. Two two hundred fifty dollars retail today. Hmm. Um, on the high end, I like the Rickenbacker Transonics. Um, oh yeah, those are really good. With the one with the fuzz and the reverb built in. Um, a silver tone metalist solid state with two two Jensen twelves, ruling. Um, a Vox Super Beetle is great. I'm I'm not afraid of old solid state amps. I think they're really immediate. I think they do a cool thing. Um, I don't dismiss any solid state amp ad hoc because you will absolutely sometimes you'll just be really really surprised at how good they sound. I mean, Lab Series is the best example of that. Hmm. Great. Oh, like the um, Baldwin Exterminator. Baldwin exterminator, yes, with the with the push switches. I worked on Neil Young's. Okay, and yeah. And first of all, it's the biggest thing. It, it was it was comical how big it is. Yeah. And and what what really makes me laugh is the fact it has a handle on the top. Yeah. It's like what you need the giant from uh, you know Game of Thrones to come and carry it for you. I mean, how, yeah. what are you supposed to do with this handle? <laughs> right. Exactly. Sounded amazing though. They're they're very Willie Nelson uses a ball. Yeah, really cool. Really, wow. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the super chat. Scent of a wheelchair pillow. <laughs> uh, took my parents to see you at Red Rocks in 2019. Great show. How do the acoustics there compare to other halls? Um, <clears throat> I think Red Rocks is. If you ask nature to build a perfect amphitheater, Red Rocks is it. I mean, it's just the distance between the rocks is perfect for concerts. There's not a bad seat in the house, 8,900, whatever it holds, and uh, 9,000. And it sounds great for the fans, and it sounds great for the for the, the the band. And you're like, wow, this is like just a perfect amphitheater. It's like we've done it like a dozen times now since, since 2014. It never gets old. Um, you run the risk with uh, Red Rocks, and we saw this last year, is you can experience all four seasons in an afternoon. Rain, sun, snow, sleet, lightning, <laughs> all in an afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. I've not been there, but I've, I've seen a video of the it's, place. It's great. It's beautiful. It's a, it's a, it's a great venue. It's a great venue. Uh, legendary Tones. Thanks for the super chat. Obviously, you collect the best of the 50s and 60s instruments and amps. The 70s are known to not be great, but have you made any guitar exceptions for your collection and found any great Fenders or Gibsons from that era? Well, I, I it's, at some point I have to cut myself off. I mean, because you could just collect that. You know, this, so I I don't really have anything past 1969, uh, maybe 1970. I do have a nice, uh, really nice uh, candy apple red telly. I got from John Five. Um, he, uh, he he sold it to me for some Kiss memorabilia. Anyway, long story short, and um, you know you have to be honest with yourself. Many of your favorite rock tones, guitar sounds, were all made on most likely a '70s Strat, Richie Blackmore, Invey, um, '70s Les Paul Custom. Tons of those 68 custom later stuff, not the not, not the golden era, quote unquote, 70s marshals, 70s twins, quads, whatever. Um, 
so there's great gear in the 70s it's just different you know poly versus nitro uh especially on the fender side you know gibson inexplicably you know when 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 they reissued the Les Paul in 68. They they did not have their finger on the pulse of what was going on. They should have reissued the Sunburst, not not the Gold Top, you know. And but the 68, 69 Les Paul customs are great because it's the only custom you could buy without a without a volute that is a maple top, where all the 50s ones were were solid mahogany. And they're great guitars, some of the best, you know best guitar sounds you get it is from a Les Paul custom from the 60s or 70s you know late 60s early 70s problem is now another now that now the, the customs are twenty thousand dollars they used to be five or six you know and but yeah there's 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 great gear all through the 70s great amps um you know there was the the whole boutique acoustic market the mosmans the gallagher's um you know a grammar all started in the 70s they were all kind of reaction to the what martin wasn't doing and you know and and you know a lot of great inventions and a lot of good stuff was made and the the, the fender silver face stuff isn't bad I no mean, no not I, at all I, I or it can be made to be good yeah yeah i mean blindfold a good working black face deluxe a good working silver face deluxe blindfold would tell the difference i couldn't i couldn't only only when they started putting master volumes on them and that that infamous bright whatever the push pull ones like yeah like, like that's real bright on the master yep oh ooh. that's that's when uh things let's just say went off the rails but you know i mean uh, you know uh again they were solid tube amps i mean like freddie king albert collins used a quad mm -hmm. killing you know right right uh matt johnson thank you joe for your great music since you've got your karina v's have you been offered the chance to buy an original Karina Explorer? Price aside, the chance for a fake would scare me away unless the provenance was CIA level. <laughs> You're correct. Um, I have three flying Vs, all of which I can trace back to Kalamazoo, Michigan, 1958. End of story. You know, I'm lucky. The one I got from Norm, I got pictures of the old man in Indianapolis. The one I bought from the... the both of them, you know, the other two came from original owners and 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 one, well, the, the, the mint one was was purchased in 1977 before the fakes were made, you know, from a preacher in Oklahoma. You know, <laughs> so I sleep well and I'll, all three of mine have cases. That's important. You got to have cases. Um, Explorers. There's a couple that I would want if I was going to do anything, but they're really really expensive you really want a brown case one with gold parts which puts it into such rarefied air the one that i loved that was loaned to me by my friend ronnie proler was uh, uh, uh the big ed one that rick Vito found the explorer and the flying v in 1990 in cincinnati and it was two brothers and the v was ordered left-handed so it had a double pick guard and, oh, wow. and dots on the other side and he would play it left-handed it looks right handed because everything's all flip flop here. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Trust me. Um, and his brother, Big Ed, played the Explorer, and Rick was able to buy both of them when he was with Fleetwood Mac. And then he sold them to my friend Ronnie. And then eventually they ended up at the Songbirds Museum, and one now the inexplicably separated the pair. And now the Explorers at Gibson and the V is unknown. I mean, those things should have been. I mean, you should have just glued them together. I mean, they they belong together. That's mm -hmm. just me opining and bitching but as far as other explorers there are real ones um but none of which have come into my radar for sale in a price that i thought was doable i mean we're talking about a really nice fucking house that that's how that's how valuable this stuff is mm -hmm. and and what do i have to prove it's like i like v's better than explorers anyway i i i, I to me they're set up i don't like on explore the switch i have to go like down and okay. to move the switch and it takes you completely out a v your, your toggle and your two volumes are like right within right you know so explorers are fantastic i, I have friends that have explorers and and they're great but you know you just have to be very very mindful yeah. of because that you that's a that's a big hit to take if you're wrong. Oh yeah. 
Uh, Leonard Rodriguez, thank you. Joe, can new pickups sound like vintage pickups? Absolutely. The only problem is, is that new pots can't sound like old pots. That's like, <laughs> that's the the chain. It's the chain. It's no. like if you put PAFs in a reissue with new pots, you're not. It's not going to sound like a Sunburst Les Paul from the '50s because of the chain. It's the chain of events. It's the now the same vendor, CTS pots. Okay, most most Gibsons and vendors. Okay, they changed the recipe. Like like before, they were they were they were military spec. All that stuff was made for military industrial use, and same thing with capacitors and everything was built to higher tolerances because they needed to make the mark to be in you know to for them to sell to the military. So. When you, if you notice on a guitar now, you turn the volume all the way down, and then sometimes you have to go a quarter turn for it to even come on. And when it comes on, it goes, ah, it jumps. Especially CTS. Especially CTS, and it's annoying. Mm -hmm. And and you know, but if a vintage pot, that thing just, that's a beautiful taper. And I notice the difference. And I, I'm a volume control dweller. That's all I do. I probably. A, yeah. 200 times a night is mess with my volume control. There's so many tones and everything you get just by messing with the volume and the tone. Now. And so to answer your question, do vintage pickups and new pickups, can they be the same? Absolutely. There's some great PAFs out there. Rob at Arcane um, here in town in Los Angeles does a great, does great everything. Great uh, flat poles, mm -hmm. you know, PAFs, um, Seymour Duncan, industry standard, you know, there's there's a lot, but you're not going to get there unless you got old pots and old caps. It's it's the whole chain of events that will get you there. Like mm -hmm. you can see new pickups in an old guitar. It's going to sound better if you sold old, old pickups in a new guitar for sure. Are there any new pots that you tend to use at all? If there are, if they're out there, I haven't found them. Hmm. Um, it's just we're you know it's the same thing with tubes. We were talking about tubes earlier. It's we're the last of the last. We're the last to use pots of that nature, quarter-inch cables. That was for operators. Right. Tubes. It's all, mm -hmm. it's all obsolete. You know, it's like, like the world has moved on, but yet we're still here going, well, they, they can't make the pots like they used to. Well, they don't make as many. They make them for Friedman amps and Gibson guitars. Okay. Yeah. They, you know, when they were making them for Fender and Gibson and all that stuff back in the day, they were making millions of them because all of it was going to other purpose uh -huh. stuff. And there was more of a demand for, for dials for, 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 you know. Yep. Yep. Different world. The analog world. Uh, Dan, the Gib for Joe, what kind of things do you look for when shopping for a great Les Paul? P.S. Dave, I own a Wildwood 20. That amp is so amazing. Thanks, dudes. Like anything, it, whatever whatever guitar speaks to you is the one for you. It could be a brand new one. It could be five years old. It could be fifty years old. If it if it if you go, man, I can't put this thing down. That's the one. You mm -hmm. know. True. Thanks, guys. Um, Brad, guitar man in Texas. Joe, can you quickly talk about your experiences working with Tom Dowd? Tom produced my first solo album, which was ultimately his, his last album that he produced. He, he, he got ill um, shortly thereafter. And when I tell you, it was like a college education that I never got in, in a year's time working with him. It was like he was the sweetest guy. He never wore his resume on his on his shirt. You know what I mean? Like if you asked him about Aretha or Otis or the Allman Brothers or Skinner or uh, – Tito Puente or Rod Stewart, he would talk about it, but he would never walk into a studio or walk into a room and be like, you know, I'm Tom Dowd and here's my, here's my resume. And I do this and I do that. And do, you know, he was just, we're here today. And, and he goes, how's the song? Work on the song. He preached that narrative. Song, 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 song. He always said, mm -hmm. you, we know you play. Let's get the song right. Right. And he was, and he was, he was very right about that. Very right. Excellent. Thanks, Brad. Uh, Bill L. 
Joe, what do you think of the current Mar I was going to ask you about this, the current Marshall Jubilee reissue in comparison to the originals. Have you played it, tried them? Yes. I'm trying to do this diplomatically. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll just say this about Jubilee. No Drake Transformer, I'm out. It, the Drakes made it. Those big, heavy things. And I don't know if Marshall can source the Drakes anymore. They don't make Transformers of that nature. I find, and again, it's not it's not, not a dis Marshall. I, 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 I own, own plenty of Marshalls. I know some people over there. Fine, fine amplifier company that doesn't need my endorsement. Um, I find that the modern Marshalls, whether it be an 18 watt combo or a blues break combo or super lead or Jubilee reissue or any of the 40 knob thing that they make. There's a inexplicable amount of top end that I can't get my head around. I'm like, who said to themselves, like, we need to make this shit brighter. Mm -hmm. And the Jubilee suffers the same fate. Like, like when you have the treble off, the presence off, and you're trying to duck them even the mid ring, and it's still, you know, peeling paint off the wall. There's a bright, there's a bright cat problem. You know, it's it's just they they find them too bright. And to reference the original ones, the original ones, the why why I like them is they weren't too bright, and you could actually put the presence up and the treble up, and you can EQ them like a regular amp, and it's just something that's with there's something with them now that that i um i don't i don't know i can't comment as, as to why i could just tell you what it sounds like to me you know yeah. and i know a lot of, plenty of bands using a reissue stuff and it's great okay but you know they're they're you would agree with it they're, they're I, right. I would say it tends to it tends to be something to do with the transformers even yeah. the little 20 watt plexis, which can be quite cool if you change a few things. Right. Uh, I still find myself, I'm ha having to roll off some stuff in there to kind of coax it into, uh, the, you know, a good old plexi has this, there's the, a compression and, a, and, a, and, a, and, a, you know, they're bright, but they're not like harsh and they're full, but they're not too fat. It, it, it It's, there's a there's a gushiness, so to speak, yeah. when you play those. And new ones tend not to have that. There is some tricks you can do to kind of coax that out of it. But um, I, I think it's really kind of the Transformers. Yeah, and, and there's a there's a there's a low mid hump that a good amp will do. And it's between 300 hertz and 500 hertz. Like if you ever want to fatten up a guitar sound studio, go right to the console, engage the EQ. Put a, like two or three dB of five hundred hertz. You'd be like, oh, there it is. There's the that's the fullness. That's 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 where the the thing starts to become nice and big and round and fat. It, uh, below that is where whales communicate or or, or birds, or whatever. Above that, it's you know uh, uh, some other animal. Uh, it, it the mid range is is you know it's not too low. It's not too high. That's that's where the guitar intrinsically lives it's almost like the human voice you know good mm -hmm. guitar sounds like really an extension of and that's why i think it, people gravitate to guitar so much because it's really a binary thing it's like like hey it sounds like i speak so he's yeah. talking through that's his true. guitar you know it's like because of the frequencies you know yeah that's yeah. true you hear somebody go he's talking through his china symbol you know he's not <laughs> <laughs> he's <talking to> <laughs> uh pete thorne what's up pete hi pete how you doing? yo joe how can you talk about the Kik kiko sui power kiko supply yeah and your experience using it with your amps any advantages I hope you're well thank you pete honored that you're listening to this um so i was watching angus young's rig rundown and you know just having fun and whatever and, and just marveling at how low of a stage volume he was using i was like you know only nine stacks tonight beautiful <laughs> you know? and uh and his tech came to the end of it it was like they showing all the gear and the guitars and stuff like that. And, and here's the last stage of our thing uh because angus likes 240 something 
and he hurts. He hurts. Mm-hmm. Where, well, being Australian and having, you know, that's where his marshals live in Australia and the UK, and that's probably where they were designed. Conversely, I was having this problem because we had started shipping our gear over to Europe. Okay, we started the live rig, and at the time I was using either two basements, two twins, or just four twins. I said, "Fuck it, make it louder." And uh, and I was noticed that like with with the conversion because we were all U.S. power, the feedback points were were different. The just the feeling under the string was slightly weird. It kind of sounded a little more anemic. But it was still loud. It was still as distorted, maybe even a little more distorted. I'm like, something's up. And when I saw the rig run down with Angus, I said, that's the trick. Is I like 120 at 60 hertz wherever I go. That's that's my that's my that's where all the amps run. It's I, it's high headroom, high efficiency, and I don't want anything starved for power. I want I want as much headroom out of those things as I possibly can get. And as soon as we went to that, especially in Europe, oh my god. Fortunes changed overnight <laughs> to the point where, because the Kikasui, it's not like a brown box or a, a, a power line conditioner where, you know, you brown it out and, and, you know, that was the Eddie thing, obviously 90 volts with the Marshall. And no, this thing will make power when power doesn't exist. So let's say the line at an old theater, let's say you're only getting 115. That thing will, will, will raise it up to 120. You know, they're it's not they're not cheap. They're like six thousand dollars because it's like a medical device that mm-hmm. people use for saving lives. And here we are plugging amps in it. You know, <laughs> but, but that's true. Wow. And and I've been using it for about seven years since I saw this. Hmm. And it's, it has completely changed so much so as Josh Smith. He's been talking about getting one because when we go to Europe, his rig doesn't sound the same. And he because it's bombing yeah. me out. I know it's 50 hertz. There's, it, it, there's a difference, you know? Wow. So that's, that's why I use the Kiki City. Yeah. Foo Fighters do also. Yep. Yeah. It, it's, it's the difference. Like it's the difference between going, it doesn't sound quite right. And then you finally get your head around it and you just live with it. And then you get back to the States and you realize, Oh fuck, man, that, that just doesn't sound as good. It sounds so much better here or making an investment in your rig. If you're touring over there, or, you know, even if you're touring here, make an investment in your rig. A, it's a hell of a line conditioner. It, it it will it will save your rig. We had a huge spike in Vegas and it blew out one of the circuits and and it, it was my circuit. And the rig the Kikasui failed five times, but it saved it, saved the amps. Mm-hmm. So it's 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 a great it did its job, is what I'm saying. And yeah. I can't I can't be give it higher praise about how it's kind of changed my life. Like especially in places with low low power coming out of the the wall or or um, Europe. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is a follow up to what uh, he was asking before. Uh, does location matter anymore if you were starting over as a musician? Yes, it still does. I think, um, unless you want to Instagram from Idaho, you know, uh, there's a lot of people that do it like that, but. You want to be surrounded, Lily. There's no better situation for a musician than being surrounded by players that are better than you, because you have you go where the players are, you know. And New York used to be where the players are. Then then New York became too expensive for music. People moved to Los Angeles. Well, then they moved to Los Angeles, and then now Los Angeles is 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 hard to hard to make a living playing here. The sessions are not as many as they used to be. Um, everybody moved to Nashville. Now, now Nashville is becoming really, really uh, expensive and, and and stuff like that. But, but you want to go where the badasses are. You know, you want to like be able to 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 um, to to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and 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 really, uh, I you know absolutely, uh, you know, be surrounded by the best of the best. So location does matter, you know? Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. Uh, Ryan, Joe, what do you think of firebird firebird pickups on other Gibson guitars? My dream guitar is a flying V with firebird pick firebird pickups. Ryan, some, some men's dreams are others nightmare. 
<laughs> no, no offense. Uh, how to make a bright guitar brighter. Put, put some bright ass pickups in a piece of Karina. Um, a friend of mine has a, a Karina Firebird, but he has humbuckers in it. Um, all right. So my favorite Firebird pickups, if they're not made by Seymour Duncan, are the the Bicentennial Firebird pickups. And uh, Johnny Winter loved those as well. They're a little higher output. You know, um, you know, a, a good way to make enemies is take a Firebird 1, a 64 Firebird 1, put it through a twin reaver with the bright switch on. That is some bright, bright, bright. Why don't and we add some JBLs to that too? JBLs, <laughs> Altex, perfect. That's, that, that, is an, that is an enemy maker. Um, I like Firebirds in the middle position or in the front position, kind of like where Johnny Winter lived. He lived in the front because um, they're, they're stratty. They're very, very stratty. Um, but the, if you can find them with higher output, it helps kind of take, take some of that, some of that brightness out of, of, of intrinsically a very, very low. I mean, they're like, they're like in the sixes, some of them, like six, three, six, one. Um, they're super low output, you know? Um, and I guess they were trying to get them to where they were clean and bright, like a fender. Um, but even strap pickups are sevens. Yeah. Seven and a half, so. Mm -hmm. Uh, Peter Schaefer. Hey guys, thanks for another great show. Thank you. Can Joe speak about his use of Palmer PDI 03s? Um, the Palmer is I use mostly for monitoring um, with the Marshall only. Uh, I monitor one Marshall with the one with the effects loop in it and it has the effects. And I find that if I take, <clears throat> because I'm stacking amps and they're kind of, they're, if I, if I mic, if I use the mic for monitoring, I use some of the mic, but not all of it. It the face gets a little washy on stage, so the Palmer is really the most direct. You know, you're not you're not really you're not really worried about the phase um, out front because everything's panned. You, the phase the phasing problem goes away. Um, I like Palmers. I think I think you know obviously they're the industry standard, um, but you, I, I also believe you got to mic something. Because the speaker is part of the sound as well, whether it's EV or Celestian, you, you, you know, it's part of that, you know, and, and it's the symbiotic relationship with the amp and the speaker. Sometimes the speaker's driving more than the amp, you know, um, so you lose that. You lose that character that the speaker gives you, which I think is critically important. But Palmer's are great. Great. Um, Kristen Coronado. Hey, Joe, I saw you. In a post that your 63 Viberverb was a mainstay in your studio, what about that amp is so good in the studio? Well, it, I don't have a studio. I have um, I don't own any recording equipment, but I, I bring a 63 Viberverb to most of the sessions I do in Nashville. It is the Ginzu knife of of uh, I'm showing my age. I don't know what a Ginzu knife. It is the it is the utility knife of Alvin <laughs> Amplifiers. I think I think it's one of Leo's greatest inventions, if not the best. It has all of the aspects of your favorite brown deluxe or super but reverb the the oxfords are great speakers for that amp i know a lot of people are it's polarizing whether they like oxfords or not i like them in brown amps and just when you put a mic on it it depends you know like if you're playing harder stuff just put a boost on it and it just it roars if you're playing clean it's like it sparkles like a black face but then when you turn up to like six and a half it it's it's big and thick and round and loves the Gibsons. It loves Gibsons. And uh, so, and yeah, they're, they're good amps. What speakers do you have in there? They're, they're the original Oxfords. Oh, okay. They're the Fender branded Oxfords that say, you know, they have the left logo on them. And and uh, I like them. Some people don't like Oxfords. I, I happen to have good experiences with Oxfords, especially in the studio. If you had to think of um, a good pair of speakers, like modern speakers, to replace that, what would be a good comparable? I'd throw a set of ceramic Celestians um, in there, and, and I would probably do the same job. I like ceramic speakers more than the Alnico. I like the tightness of the bottom and the mid range. It's just, mm -hmm. just a part mm -hmm. of it. Um, Nightjar, I don't see your question, but I saw it earlier in the other one. Um, he was talking about a hand injury, and do you know any good surgeons, hand surgeons? I knock on wood. I've never done. It. <laughs> like, oh, like, knock on wood. No. No, no, I don't have a recommendation for you, Nightjar. That's that's a hard one. You know. Yeah. Hard 
that's a tough one. So I hope you hope you get that sorted yeah, out. Well, man. Like, yeah, that's a drag. That, that is our, all all of our oh. nightmares for sure. Um, I know we're hitting up on almost two hours. Uh, Joe, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. And any, any anytime, honored to be here, Dave. We got to get you up. Got to got to see nervous. You know, you know where my house is. You were up here all the time. So yes, I know exactly where your house is. Maybe we, Pete we, Thorne and I'll come up one day. We, let's let's do it. You can see what hang out. Guitar amps looks like in 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 a in a home setting. Ninety percent, I can guarantee, have been sitting around so long that they don't work. You know. <laughs> well, then you got Dave there. He can. He... <laughs> no, he. You, you want nothing to do with this. This is this is this, beyond. Yeah. Well, I want to thank everybody who watched the show. Thank you so much. Sorry if we didn't get to your questions. I know there was probably more that weren't super chats, and uh, well, you know. We'd be here forever. Yeah, we can be here for we can only, we can only do so well. We'll be, yeah. be at four o'clock in the morning. And yeah. Yeah. yeah, Joe's got to eat sometime and get some rest. You, you know, uh, answering questions about Palmers and Firebirds. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Our next show is with Billy Morrison on uh, October. You remember, Dave? No. <laughs> October 6th. Okay. Is with Billy Morrison. You can't expect me to remember. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. I, I just had to check. I have to look at our own social media to know which shows yeah. win. Yeah. No big deal. Joe, really a pleasure to meet you. Thank pleasure. you so much for coming on. Absolutely. Thank you very much for everything. And, and by the way, Dave, I, I haven't told you, but by the way, I, the, the pedal boards, uh, the, the pedal board that you built me in 2011 or 12, still the same. Yeah. I saw pictures. I saw it's the same. Yeah. Same, same yeah. goal. I'm glad it's been, table. you know, if you ever have a problem with it, let me know. Same everything, man. That's the <laughs> testament to your build quality. If you, if, if you ever need it gone through or anything, please let me know. I'm right here. Yeah, I'm worried. I always get worried about, like, go, like, like preventative maintenance because I'm worried, worried it's going to come back and not sound the same. I'm like, it's like something's got to break catastrophically for me to, to throw it. Well, you know. you know, the thing with pedal boards, what happens is, you know, contacts get dirty and stuff, you know, right. and, and like, you know, little jacks and they get a little crusty and you can lose signal and some stuff just needs to be cleaned. Exactly. Like some some I, deoxid and stuff, and you know. I gotta bring it in for a two hundred thousand mile checkup. Too. Yeah, we don't want to change anything. Just clean it. Yeah. Exactly. Make sure it's all solid. All right, but, gentlemen. Thank you very much. We awesome. got one last question before you leave. To someone always has to throw something in. What is an old underdog vintage combo amp that you love that doesn't get enough credit? Silver tone fourteen eighty one. Oh, that's a good one. There you love go. it. Yeah. All right. That's 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 a that's a deluxe killer too. Very cool. Joe, thank you so much. Oh, is there anything coming up that you want to promote? Anything you want to tell us about? I'm off. I'm off until October 25th or 6th, so I'm off. And uh the only thing I got coming up uh is uh, uh Eric Clapton's Crossroads at the end of the, at the end of the month, which I'm which is which is next week. So, really looking forward to that. Um seeing him and and the the camaraderie and uh yeah we're playing the the, the crypto.com arena which is it's it, it's the fucking staple center you know it's like, it's, it's, it will always be the it's, like, it's the same it's the stable center you know it's like you know when when they when gibson actually uh sponsored the universal amphitheater it's like the gibson answer what the hell is that it's universal amphitheater thank you very much now it's harry potter so yeah you want yep. to there you go all right guys all right, thank you very night. much thank, thank you guys. take care everybody all right bye, bye.